if you are busy, if you've got tons on your plate, if you've got tons on your to-do list and you're thinking that, you know, you wish there was someone to give you some help, there is a huge range of virtual assistants available to you that can do all kinds of different tasks. And above all else, you know, really, really consider the value of your time, whether you want to spend more time on the sofa relaxing, more time with family and friends, or more time growing and scaling your business, then you know, delegating and getting a virtual assistant is a, you know, one of the best steps that you can possibly take. Uh, I've done it and I am feeling awesome about it and I would love to help you do it as well. I am Noel Andrews and I'm the CEO and owner of JobRack. Uh, I bought JobRack around about three years ago. Uh, it was pretty small at the time and uh, so we've been building and growing it since then. Um, before that, I had 15 years experience in kind of the corporate world in a range of kind of technology leadership roles. So up to kind of director level in, in very big uh, kind of, you know, kind of hundreds of millions and, and kind of billions of pounds companies uh, across kind of travel, hospitality uh, and gaming. So a bit of a kind of varied background, but everything has always involved lots of kind of leading of teams, hiring of people uh, and kind of a lot of, uh, yeah, that kind of hiring and leading kind of process. What sparked your interest about virtual assistants? I have been involved in, a, in an online community for about kind of four or five years. And uh, there it's very, very commonplace. So lots of business owners seeking to be location independent and often using virtual assistants to kind of help them uh, in, that, uh, in that kind of process and kind of achieving the life that they want. And I think it was around about the time that I joined the community that I also read the four hour work week with Tim Ferriss, uh, like so many of us. And uh, yeah, that was kind of the real kind of first uh, kind of inkling into kind of virtual assistants and hiring remotely. And then since then, it's been a whirlwind. And you know, now I have a business that helps people to hire really, really great virtual assistants myself. What was your first experience with virtual assistants? So my first experience was hiring someone uh, two weeks after I'd bought JobRack. So I bought this business. I did all the due diligence. It happened very, very quickly. I had this kind of custom tech stack, uh, custom software, loads of complexity. And, you know, we started kind of, you know, people were uh, purchasing and they were advertising jobs and it was just me. And I was running a consulting job at the same time. And so I needed some help. And so I hired someone to help me initially with kind of customer support. Uh, but there was a range of tasks. So that was my first kind of virtual assistant uh, and remote hire. And uh, yeah, that, uh, that guy, Vladan, he, he did all kinds of things for me, stayed with me for well over a year and, uh, you know, was instrumental in me kind of really that those first kind of few months, especially of kind of buying and, um, and scaling job rack. So it's interesting that you actually hired your first virtual office assistant after acquiring a company that helped others to hire virtual assistants. Yeah, definitely. And it was, and obviously I used my own platform to hire him as well. And so, uh, yeah, I kind of ticked all the boxes with that one, uh, but I needed help. And, um, you know, obviously kind of, you have to eat your own dog food as, as they say. Uh, but that it, was, it was a great experience and now kind of helping other people to hire their own virtual assistants is, is really, really great. And it uh, makes for some good, good, rewarding times. What made you decide to buy JobRack? Of all the different businesses you could be in, why remote workers and virtual assistants? I would love to say that I had a crystal ball that just said, you know, I could predict the future and that the whole world was going to wake up to remote work. But, you know, even I didn't have that one. Um, I had been looking for uh, an idea or a business to get involved in for, for a few years. Uh, like I said, I had, you know, 15 years of kind of corporate experience, lots of involvement in kind of people management and hiring. And I spent about a year and a half building or trying to build a interview coaching business. So knowing that, you know, hiring is hard, doesn't matter, you know, how experienced you are, whether you're a candidate or whether you're an employer, hiring is hard. And so one of the things that I recognized was that it's really hard for candidates to actually come across well in interviews. And so one of the things that I launched first of all, or tried to launch and, and kind of spent about a year doing was an interview coaching business. So helping candidates, you know, perform better at interviews. And so I've done that for a little while, realized that actually that wasn't uh, particularly scalable or not in the way that I wanted it to be. And so I was just on the lookout and JobRack came up for sale. Uh, it had been a bit of a kind of a sideline for a little while of the guys that owned it at the time. They'd done really well with it, but then had uh, kind of paused things a little bit to focus on their own thing. And um, it was just kind of serendipity for me. It was in an area that I knew well, kind of hiring and recruitment. It was already niche down. So JobRack is focused purely on Eastern Europe and really, really high quality remote talent from Eastern Europe. 
And so the fact that it was already niche down, it wasn't too general um, because with any business, the, the more niche down you are, then the better uh, in, in my experience and from a lot of the advice that I've had. And it was just kind of perfect timing. Uh, it wasn't, uh, like I said, it wasn't a big business. So it wasn't a huge amount of money. And uh, it had that kind of bit of a brand and the tech stack there already. So it was just a great opportunity to not have to start from zero. I could start from kind of, you know, two or three rungs up the ladder uh, and then grow it and build it from there. Why did you like the niche of Eastern Europe? Eastern Europe is uh, an absolute sweet spot of remote talent. So it's an area of the world that for us at least, you know, we encompass around 22 countries. Uh, although we do probably 90% of our recruiting and hiring from probably around six or seven countries focus kind of around the Balkans. Eastern Europe in general, and, and on one hand, I try and avoid generalizations, but on the other hand, you know, so often they're, they're, they're so true, and especially in this case. So Eastern Europe has, you know, first of all, it has incredible infrastructure, you know, really, really good power, really, really good internet. You know, some of my team have got better internet connections for a lower cost than I have in London, which, you know, is a bit crazy. Um, but, it, but it's true. So they've got really, really solid kind of stable infrastructure. That's one thing that really makes them stand out. Um, they have, uh, you know, they don't have extreme weather. OK, so, you know, as a kind of a location in the world, they, you know, really, really stable, which is great. You know, it means that there's kind of less distractions or things that can go on that could kind of take your team uh, or your team members away from you. And then we get into the education system. The education system is incredibly, incredibly strong. It is really, really common for kind of people to have not one but two degrees um, to have learned English and be practicing English to a really, really high level. And the technical education system, especially around things like kind of graphic design, software development, software engineering, is really, really strong. So they kind of really attracted me. And then you get into kind of the people themselves. And two kind of key things really stand out. One is from a communication perspective, they are really, really direct. They are very happy to kind of like kind of uh, challenge you uh, as a boss and as a manager and say, look, you know, there's not enough requirements here. Or you've just asked me for a square wheel, as it were. You know, and actually just be really, really straight with you, which is so refreshing uh, and is really, really great. And then the other one is, you know, culturally, their work ethic is just incredible. You know, they expect to work hard. They want to work hard and, you know, they want to do a really, really great job, which you'd kind of like that to think that we could expect that from kind of everyone all over the world. But sadly, for those of us in the Western world, we know that that's not always the case. Uh, often we see a bit more of a kind of sense of entitlement uh, in, uh, in kind of some of the Western world. And some of that's a good thing. Uh, but certainly see in Eastern Europe, we see this, this incredible, uh, incredible work ethic. Uh, and then finally, you know, in much of Eastern Europe, there is a much lower cost of living than if you're in the USA or in Canada or the UK, for instance. So that lower cost of living translates to, uh, you know, lower salaries. So the team members that I have and the people that we help businesses to recruit in Eastern Europe, you know, they can be on really great salaries for them locally, really, really fair, doing really, really well, especially compared to working remotely but still delivering a significant cost saving to businesses versus, you know, trying to hire kind of locally. And what that means for businesses is potentially either that they can hire faster or sooner than they otherwise could afford to hire, or they can scale quicker. So instead of getting, you know, kind of not being able to afford one person, they can get someone and then their business grows. And then perhaps they can have a second or a third person uh, before potentially they would have been able to hire one or two people in, um, you know, kind of locally. So uh, that, those are the things that really, really kind of attracted me and still attract me and still you know, get me excited about working with people from Eastern Europe every day. How do you find candidates for your clients? How do you pick out the great ones? We have a very extensive process. Um, and it starts from the very, very first moment when we're talking to a client or a customer or a business owner. And it all starts with helping them figure out what is it that they really want. Because they need, if you, you've got to know what it is that you want in order to be able to kind of for us to go out and, uh, and find it. And then the second piece is just really making sure people understand that a job post is a sales page. Uh, you know, we are trying to sell an opportunity and to get the really, really, the really great candidates, the best candidates. It's about getting them excited about the opportunity to work with, uh, you know, with a business. And even where it's a role that the business owner might not be very excited about, it might be, you know, doing administration, doing admin, doing bookkeeping, doing research. The business owner may can't, you know, possibly maybe they can't wait to get rid of these tasks. But to someone else, a virtual assistant that's really organized that loves doing research, they love this kind of work. So it's about making it kind of exciting, first of all, making their job posts stand up. So we do things like we encourage our employers and our business owners to record a short video to kind of introduce the role. We encourage them to include team pictures uh, or kind of almost mini testimonials from their existing team in the job post. So everything we can do to kind of excite, uh, you know, people and encourage them to apply. 
and then kind of that's where we kick into gear and we've got you know probably around 45 or 46 channels that we go through now to source the really really best candidates so everything from you know private slack communities in eastern europe facebook groups focused on kind of content writers in eastern europe uh, software development groups you know the kind of conventional platforms like linkedin some less conventional ones for recruiting developers like github you know and many many more besides and we just we know where to look to kind of uh, kind of turn over the rocks to find the you know the best candidates for for our candidate for our clients what can i as an entrepreneur or business owner do to find the best talent first thing is make sure you know what you want okay or so often that i see people start to hire and they're not very clear on what it is that they want and they therefore kind of find kind of either generalists or find people that uh, you know can't kind of really jump in with both feet because you know you're not clear what you want so first thing is get clear be really really clear about what you want because then you can figure out where to go to find the best talent um, the second thing is you know get advice get help and advice whether it's from friends from peers from people that have already hired from kind of hiring platforms you know get advice from people you know most people you know i for instance jump on calls all the time with uh, with business owners to kind of or entrepreneurs to kind of help them shape their thoughts and figure out what it is that they need so once you know what you need and then you've got an idea maybe where to look. The key thing is then with your job post, really make it stand out. So use, you know, perhaps do an introduction, little kind of 30 second intro video at the start, introducing yourself and the business, get people excited to apply, include pictures. Uh, you know, have you got a team already or if you've got kind of pictures of your products or of your customers, any kind of testimonials, anything to get people excited about kind of working for you and your business. These are the kind of things that will make your job post really, really stand out. And then finally, you know, make sure you're hunting in the right place. You know, people talk about fishing in the right pond. So if you are looking for, you know, really great content writers, for instance, make sure that you're advertising your role on a site that has really great content writers. Um, it doesn't always have to be a specialist site, but make sure it's in a place where, you know, great content writers are hanging out uh, looking for good jobs. Um, so these, there's some kind of the main things. And above all else, you know, not many people, business owners especially, are generally experts in hiring because that's kind of not your job uh, or certainly not your area of expertise. So, you know, kind of get help. Lots of lots of free help out there. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can kind of uh, choose to kind of work with a service to kind of help you do it. But the main thing is kind of seek help and, and kind of look to learn as much as you can. What are the three most common mistakes in hiring remote team members? And what are the solutions to avoid those mistakes? Three most common mistakes that I see. So number one is when people rush the process. Typically, when entrepreneurs and business owners come to hire their first virtual assistant, it's normally long after they should have hired their first virtual assistant. So they're absolutely snowed under. They're absolutely maxed out. They've got tasks coming out of their, out their ears, to-do lists everywhere, and they need help. And so hiring a virtual assistant is now one more massive task that's on their list. So maybe they get a kind of a, a good enough job post out there. Maybe they get it onto a good enough job site and then they start interviewing it. And then it's like the first one that's good enough. Right. And it's like, oh, they'll do. Let's just give them a job. Let's get going. And that's a bit of a recipe for disaster. You can get lucky, but it's not ideal. So that's the kind of the first mistake is when people rush it. The a little bit of time in this process, a little bit of time at this stage is going to pay massive dividends later. So really, really, it's important to kind of hire slow and fire fast is the is the kind of the typical saying, but yeah, definitely kind of hire slow or hire a little bit slowly. So that's the first mistake. Second mistake is not having a clear agreement in place with your new hire. So, you know, if you were employing someone locally or with a big company, you'd have a contract of employment, very, very standard. All too often in the remote world, people don't do this. And it's really, really simple. And all you need is like, you know, a one or a two page kind of service agreement. It's typically what, what we use, um, what we recommend people to use. And the purpose is all it is, is just to set expectations. It's just to make sure that both sides know how much you're going to pay, when you're going to pay, how you're going to pay, setting expectations around things like uh, confidentiality and notice periods, just very, very basic things that are super simple to do that just get the relationship off on the right kind of start. Uh, you always want to kind of trust people, but there's some things, especially where it's around money and salary, that it's just much better to just get it down on paper. So always have an agreement. And, you know, lots of people kind of tend to skip that. And then not often find out later on that there was just some misunderstanding. And when there's misunderstandings about money and salary, it always gets a little bit, little bit kind of a um, little bit tense. So you can avoid that with a simple one page uh, kind of simple service agreement. And then the third mistake is around onboarding. 
So when someone starts working for you, you need to put the time in to onboard them effectively. Uh, you need to really kind of be almost overly intentional. So if someone was working in an office with you, for instance, you're going to see them when they come in in the morning. Maybe you're going to have a cup of coffee with them. Maybe you're going to see them at lunchtime in their first week. And you might, you know, just spend that kind of natural time or stop by their desk. When people are remote, those kind of uh, almost organic kind of meeting points and meeting times just don't happen. So you have to put the time in. So think carefully to yourself before they start. What systems do they need access to? Uh, what things do they need to learn? What documents do they need? Uh, and what guidance do they need from you in order so that they can you know, do their job effectively? It's really important for you to figure out what you want and how you like to work. So here at JobRack, I have a you know, ways of working document that we share with all the team. Uh, that's just open about, you know, right from little tiny things like uh, in the morning when you start work or the afternoon, depending on your on your schedule. Um, you know, just jump in Slack and say good morning or good afternoon. And say, hey, it's just nice to know when people are working um, and not from a big brother sense, just from a let's have a chat and let's, you know, know who's working, just like you would if you're in an office. Um, right down to kind of really, really detailed things like, you know, when you're sharing a Google document, you know, this is how we like you to do it. Um, you know, always set the link to be open to anyone in the team. Things like that, that if they're not done, they're just minor annoyances. So, you know, figure out what's important to you uh, and set those clear expectations. So, uh, yeah, they're the main things. So don't rush the hiring process. Have a clear agreement and uh, make sure to do a really good job and kind of spend some time on the onboarding. Do you have a personal virtual assistant? Mm, I do have a personal uh, virtual assistant and uh, only very recently, though. So, again, like I've just talked about, I should have had one a long time ago. I've been doing tasks that other people can do for a considerably lower cost than kind of my time is worth. Um, and kind of from that value perspective, I should have done it a long time ago, but I've, yeah, I've just treated myself as it were. Uh, and I now have someone to, and I refer to kind of her as a personal assistant uh, because she's doing things that aren't just within the business. So yeah, hired very recently uh, is amazing. He's making life so, so much better and kind of works across both, uh, you know, job rack, um, some other work that I do, all aspects of personal life, you know, everything from kind of, yeah, travel arrangements to researching, you know, rooftop bars for an event that I'm running shortly to, you know, accounting and bookkeeping, all kinds of things. So, uh, yeah, finally taking the plunge and got my own kind of personal assistant as well. How did you go about hiring? Did you make any of the mistakes that other people make? I'm really pleased to say that I didn't, I did not make any of those mistakes, but I had to be very, very intentional about that. No, even for me, you know, I have been hiring for many, many years. I spend my time advising other business owners and entrepreneurs on how to hire. It's still very tempting to kind of you know hire fast, right? Because I've got loads on my to-do list as well. I'm in the same boat as any other entrepreneur. But no, I was very, very intentional about it. I took it very, very slowly. I thought about what was really important to me. And there were particular things that I knew for me that was really important. So I wanted someone that could make phone calls for me. So if they needed to phone, you know, businesses uh, here in London, so I'm, I'm based here in London, in England, uh, if I needed them to make phone calls, I wanted them to be able to do it, not just rely on email communication. So there were little kind of uh, kind of particulars like that, that I really wanted to make sure that they could do and do really well. So now I took my time over the process, thought very clearly up front about what I needed. Uh, I've had a list for about two years of kind of future assistant tasks. And every now and again, I'll just make an entry on that list. And as that list has built up, that's helped to then finally kind of justify and saying, yes, it's now time to, to get an assistant. So, no, happy to say I didn't make any of those mistakes. And uh, I am really, really putting in the time, especially when someone's a personal assistant. You know, getting to know you is so crucial, knowing what you like and, you know, setting clear expectations. So when I'm assigning tasks and writing things down, I'm trying to be really, really clear about, you know, what it is that I'm looking for. Uh, or if I'm being vague because I don't know, then I'm just being kind of open about that. So I use Loom a lot to record kind of quick screen share videos. Uh, all the time, I'll be walking down the street on my mobile phone, recording a quick video uh, and sharing it with them. And, and that kind of works really well. And it's nice and personal as well. Yeah, you do use a video a lot. That's also, I got some videos from you and I thought they were uh, standard videos, but then you mentioned my name and the weather and whatever. So I knew it was real. And I think that's something really special that you do uh, with your clients, but then you also use it in your team. You use video communication a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Probably three or four days a week. So I always like to do a morning message. Like I just said, I, I like my team to say, hey, and good morning when they start work. And probably three or four days a week, uh, I will be wa walking to an office. I tend to work out of WeWork offices uh, around London or wherever I am. And yeah, I'll kind of shoot just a quick video. I'll show them where I am. 
Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a cool backdrop or not. Sometimes it might be something really noticeable like Big Ben or Trafalgar Square here in London. Other times it might just be, you know, a street with buildings. Um, but it's a really nice way just to kind of chat to them about what's going on in my day, uh, what I'm excited about, anything that I want to let them know about. Uh, and I'll typically ask some questions. And just again, it's all about kind of team motivation. And so, you know, if I'm excited about the business, it's a lot more, lot easier for them to be excited too. And it's really, really effective. It's, um, it's so much more personal than, you know, just shooting emails or Slack messages. And uh, yeah, it's just one of the things that I do to, um, yeah, kind of have fun, uh, you know, and kind of add a little bit of play into, uh, into the workday. What can people do if they're not sure about hiring a virtual assistant, maybe in the future? What is something that you can do today? So if you're thinking that, you know, one day or even if you're thinking that right now you'd love an assistant, but maybe you can't afford it or you can't justify it right now, then the best thing you can do is just start a list. So whether you use Asana or Trello or a paper notebook, doesn't matter. Maybe if you use a paper notebook, you know, turn to the back page and have a future assistant tasks list. And just hours and when you think about things that you think, oh, they could have done that. Uh, you know, add it to the list. If you do any kind of like weekly review process or monthly review process, I really recommend asking yourself, what could I have delegated this week? What could people have helped me with? Uh, and that I found really, really powerful. And it links in with a kind of think about who can do something, uh, do a task, not how to do the task. So start that list and just slowly it'll build over time, review it now and again. And then suddenly you'll, one day you'll look at the list and you'll be like, there is more than enough on here for to A, justify the assistant, but also when you realize that you are doing those tasks and that you could pay someone perhaps five, six, seven or eight dollars an hour to do those tasks, pretty sure that you, you know, all entrepreneurs and a business owner should be valuing their time considerably higher than that. That might give you the little nudge that you need to be able to uh, kind of take steps to, to get your assistant. Hiring a virtual assistant feels like a luxury and people feel they can't afford it. How do you deal with when business owners have that as an excuse or a reason not to hire? I think there's two key things that comes into it is, is one is if you weren't doing those tasks, what else could you be doing? OK, that's the first. And that's the obvious one. Uh, and there's two kind of like, you know, subcategories to this in a sense. So one is that you won't be doing these kind of lower level tasks and then you can focus on whatever it is that you do best. So often with kind of uh, entrepreneurs and business owners, it's going to be around the sales or marketing or business development side of things. So, you know, you will have more time to grow your business. OK, so literally more minutes and hours in the day. And the second thing around this is that you will, um, your head will be clearer because you're not trying to juggle a million different tasks, right? Uh, and lower level things that need some concentration. So whatever it is that, you know, you might be doing. So there will just be less things on your plate and that gives you more focus. That gives you, you know, better ability to kind of get into kind of deep work or get into flow, for instance. And that makes a huge, huge difference. Just having less on the list, knowing things are being taken care of. So they're the first things to think about and say, you know, what else can you do with your time uh, that, you know, is almost certainly kind of more valuable. And then the second thing, and this is often ignored, is it's not just about you doing more to grow your business. You know, the reason you have a cleaning lady, for instance, or a cleaning person is because you don't want to clean and because you want to spend that time, you know, with your family, with your friends, having a beer, having a barbecue, going out for coffee, whatever it might be. And the same is true with a virtual assistant or any team member. You don't have to spend the time that you free up working. It's completely okay to sit on the sofa and watch some sport or go out for a bike ride or go and spend time with friends. Actually, that is hugely more valuable. You know, I, uh, one of the things that I will very regularly do, for instance, is I will get an Uber to or from the office in the morning because it allows me to have a phone call with a friend where if I take the, the London Underground where there's not signal, then I can't do that. And so sometimes that feels like a little luxury. And then I catch myself and I say, well, that just cost me 10 or $15 equivalent. And that's hugely worth it because that, that conversation was, you know, was great. It's really nice to catch up with friends. So think about not just the, you know, how much more money can you make if you're not doing the, the lower level tasks, but, you know, what kind of value of time can you get? And, you know, friends, family, just relaxing, doing nothing, reading a book, you know, all hugely valuable tasks that we often don't put the right amount of uh, kind of value or money on. You have a company that helps entrepreneurs and business owners hire remote talent. Why do you write a book about it, giving away all your secrets and your steps and your templates? I really like helping people. And I spend a huge portion of my time kind of uh, helping people out with tips and with advice and explaining to them how to hire. Like I said before, hiring is hard. And, you know, all of the advice that is within the book and within the guides that we share is, you know, you can follow that and you will, you know, if you follow it, you will hire a really great person. Um, 
but I just want to be kind of help people out. And what will almost certainly happen is that some people will take in all of this information and then decide that actually, no, they still want some more help and they want us to help them hire. And that's completely cool. Obviously, I'd love that. Lots of them will kind of take the advice and they'll hire themselves. Maybe they'll hire through JobRack. That's also great. Other people will kind of take the advice and they might hire elsewhere. And that, again, that's completely cool. Because for me, it's, you know, the, uh, I think it's what is it, the Zig Ziglar quote is, you know, you can have anything in the world that you want, as long as you help other people have what it is that they want. And I'm a big fan of that. You know, that makes the world go round for me. And so I just want to help people out. So uh, I really do hope people find it useful. Uh, you know, when I do help people out and share kind of content and guides and advice with them, uh, I get really great feedback. And, you know, I like feeling appreciated. And uh, I'm quite comfortable with that. And yeah, it makes me feel good, makes the world go round. I help more people, keeps making the world go round. It, it's all good why would people buy the book as business owners we have tons to do okay whether you're an early stage entrepreneur or a seasoned veteran with a you know a significant company hiring is hard and it's one of those things that is crucial for you to kind of live the life that you want and have the business that you want and so what i wanted to do is really to share the information on how to delegate effectively and digital delegation is exactly that with myself and with Esther, uh, we are both kind of seasoned pros in the world of kind of outsourcing and delegating uh, using virtual assistants. And in the book, we share, you know, exactly what you need to do and why you might want to do it uh, to really kind of just improve your life and uh, you know, build a better business. And there's lots of examples in there about the kinds of things that you can uh, kind of delegate uh, and how to do it, how to do it effectively. And ultimately, you know, the step by step Uh, kind of guide to hiring really, really great virtual assistants. And so when people read the book uh, and kind of follow the advice, then, you know, they're going to see the massive, massive shift that it can make to their life and their business and um, yeah, kind of hopefully, uh, hopefully get some great value from it. What would you say to somebody who says, I would really like one, but I don't have the time to hire? Simple. I can help. So uh, we have here at JobRack, for instance, and there's many other hiring services as well. But uh, here at JobRack, we have kind of three different options. And I always talk about this. It's, you know, hiring is hard, like I said, and it's a bit like climbing a mountain. What you want to do is you want to get to the top and take that amazing photo, hopefully with your arm wrapped around your new, uh, your new hire. And so we kind of have three options. So at the kind of low cost end uh, in financial cost, but not necessarily in your time, is the kind of do it yourself, the DIY approach. You can post a job ad and, uh, you know, you manage the process and kind of you a bit like the mountain and uh, kind of idea, you know, you put the heavy rucksack on, you find your own path up the mountain and, uh, you know, get your new hire. And we give help and advice. And obviously you've got lots in the digital delegation book that we're talking about here. Um, but, you know, that's your kind of your self uh, kind of guided route. And then at the top end, we've got the ultra luxury option. It's the helicopter to the top of the mountain. Uh, that's the done for you service where we literally do everything for you and we deliver, you know, maybe two or three candidates fully vetted, fully interviewed uh, for your kind of final approval. And then we have a middle option, which is what we call our done with you service. And that is where we are like your mountain guide or your Sherpa. So you have a team of people working with you, helping guide you up the mountain. So we are carrying the heavy load. We've got the rucksacks. You just have to kind of follow step by step uh, and kind of uh, come with us on the journey. We do all the hard work uh, and we get you a really, really great shortlist of candidates for you to then interview and find the one that's kind of a really good fit for you. And again, we kind of give you all the help and advice you need throughout the process, whether that's around kind of what agreements to use, what holiday to offer, how much to pay, how to onboard them, all that kind of help advice. So you get your mountain guides and your Sherpas right the way through the process, right through to getting you a really great hire uh, and beyond. And, and that's kind of how we, how we work. So if you're worried that you haven't got time to hire, but you really want to, then get in touch. Uh, and look for kind of hiring services like the one that I run at JobRack that can help you get the results that you need. If I have a task, I go to Upwork. What is the difference between doing that and hiring a virtual assistant? So the main thing you need to think about, if you're considering hiring on a kind of a freelancer platform versus uh, hiring you know, for yourself, is you know, how closely do you want to work with the person and how committed to you do you want them to be? Uh, some good friends of mine refer to this as shower thoughts. So ideally what you want is you want their shower thoughts. And that means that they're working for you. And when they're in the shower in the morning, they're thinking a little bit about their job and about you and how they can do it, do it better. You don't tend to get that when you're just outsourcing individual tasks for maybe, you know, a, an hour a day or a couple of hours a week. That tends to come when there's a bit more commitment on both sides. 
So what we focus on at JobRack and what I help people hire is long-term committed team members. So especially when you're going to make that kind of time investment and financial investment in a virtual assistant, you want someone that's going to learn how you work, what's important to you, your particular kind of tastes and preferences, whether that's which airline you like to fly, the kind of Airbnbs you like, how you like your spreadsheets formatted, whatever it might be. Uh, that is something that only comes with working with the same person for a, you know, a kind of prolonged period of time. So, you know, you can get, if you've just got some individual little tasks that you need doing, then platforms like Upwork and Fiverr and others can be absolutely great. Uh, but if you're really looking for kind of a long-term committed kind of team member, then, you know, that's the kind of key difference when you're looking for a virtual assistant, you're looking for someone long-term. So, you know, you can sometimes get them on those platforms, it can turn out pretty expensive in the long-term. So that's when you really want to be looking to kind of get yourself a, you know, a team member and almost an employee uh, in uh, by any other name. How much do you have to pay a good virtual assistant from Eastern Europe? Our starting salary for a virtual assistant in Eastern Europe will typically be around $800 US dollars per month. And that's for full time, 40 hours a week. The that's kind of an entry level VA. They might have some experience. They will be switched on. They will be smart and very, very committed. Uh, if you go a little bit higher, so that's, that's kind of around five bucks and five dollars an hour. If you go a little bit higher into around six dollars an hour, so a thousand US dollars per month, then you're starting to get someone with some real experience. They might often have some kind of extra skills as well. So maybe they've been doing kind of social media work before or a little bit of graphic design or you know, potentially some kind of project management or project coordination. And so certainly this kind of range between five and I'd say seven or five and eight dollars an hour. It is amazing the quality of people that you can get huge range of skills, really, really great English uh, people that have potentially worked for, you know, very, very large multinational corporations, uh, right down to people that have worked for kind of online remote businesses, you know, administering e-commerce systems like kind of Shop Shopify or Amazon Seller Central, um, handling social media, marketing tasks, all kinds of things like that. So typical range would be from kind of 800 to 1,200 US dollars per month for full time. And naturally, you can start part time. You don't have to start 40 hours a week. Uh, you might be worried that you haven't got enough work for 40 hours a week, and that's completely okay. You can start as low as, you know, maybe five or 10 hours a week uh, and build up over time. But it's very, very cost effective and, uh, you know, really, really great, great quality for that as well. When you have an employee, you also pay social security and taxes. Is this amount including? These salaries are the total cost that you will pay, uh, you know, to this person. So because typically they're going to be in a different country from where you're located, it's generally not legally possible for you to actually employ them with a, you know, a kind of an employee contract. So the way that it typically works is that they would be an independent contractor. Uh, if you're in the US, you might have heard the phrase the 1099 contractor, but they will be like an independent uh, kind of company in a sense. They would invoice you each month for the work uh, and then you would pay that invoice. And then, they're then they are then responsible for their own kind of tax and social security and contributions in their country, you know, wherever that may be. So your cost is, so if, if it's $1,000 a month US uh, salary, that's your total cost. And then they may kind of handle their own kind of tax, um, that side of things. Um, in terms of kind of payment methods, lots of very efficient and low cost ways to do that these days, including you know, transfer wise, which is my pay, uh, favorite. I think they're just called wise these days uh, or Payoneer and you know, even things like PayPal, but the fees can add up a little bit with PayPal, but certainly transfer wise and Payoneer are really competitive and um, yeah, the uh, it's kind of so they, they work for themselves in this regard, but in all other in kind of purposes, you treat them as a as kind of a team member, as if they're one of your employees. Uh, you know, treat them just the same as you would anyone else. Involve them in team meetings, same perks and benefits wherever you can, and uh, yeah, that's what makes for a you know a successful relationship. If you are busy, if you've got tons on your plate, if you've got tons on your to do list, and you're thinking that you know you wish there was someone to give you some help. There is a huge range of virtual assistants available to you that can do all kinds of different tasks. If you need some inspiration, then check out digital delegation. There's tons in here. If you'd like to chat through, then feel free to get in touch. Uh, and above all else, you know, really, really consider the value of your time, whether you want to spend more time on the sofa, relaxing, more time with family and friends or more time growing and scaling your business. Then you know, delegating and getting a virtual assistant is a, you know, one of the best steps that you can possibly take. Uh, I've done it and I am feeling awesome about it and I would love to help you do it as well. So uh, look forward to hearing from you and happy hiring.